Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we will be getting started in a couple of minutes, um, so uh, stay tuned. We've, we'll be starting exactly at 3 o'clock, and thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I'd love to welcome all of you to our Blaze Sports Youth Lead webinar this afternoon. Pardon me. Uh, before I introduce our wonderful panelists, I have a couple of housekeeping things. Um, first is the, the Blaze Sports Youth Lead Initiative was started in 2019, early 2019, to really help build the leadership skills of young people with disabilities and really help prepare them for um, uh, graduating high school and moving on to either college or university or employment, if that was their path. So our topic today is really, um, uh, really aligns with our youth lead and what we want to try and achieve with that and is pathways to successful transition for youth with disabilities. Before I introduce our panelists, um, the, this webinar will be recorded and so if you need to hop off at any time, uh, not to worry, we will be sending the recording out to all of the registrants and it will be available on our youth lead website. Um, we also will have time for questions um, at the end of the uh, presentation. And so please, during the, um, during the webinar presentation, enter your questions in the question box on your webinar panel. Um, and last but not least, I would really love to acknowledge the Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency for supporting our Youth Lead Initiative um, and really believing in um, the, the power of sport, which is aligning with Play Sports mission, but also helping our young people be successful on and off the field of play. So without further ado, I'm really excited to have uh, our panelists with us today, Ms. Amber Wiggins and Courtney Dean, with both with the Epilepsy Foundation of Georgia and the EF Works program. Um, I'm very um, excited about our partnership with the Epilepsy Foundation of Georgia and how our missions align. So let me tell you a little bit about um, Amber and Courtney, and I'll turn the PowerPoint over to them. So Amber is an employment coordinator with the Epilepsy Foundation of Georgia, um, and she handles employer partner relations. Um, so she engages with the Georgia business community in promoting the hiring of qualified workers with epilepsy and seizure disorders. Um, Amber received her bachelor's degree in psychology from Georgia State, and then went on to receive her master's in clinical rehabilitation counseling in 2014. Courtney is an employment specialist also with the Epilepsy Foundation of Georgia, and she manages and implements job readiness training. She conducts intake and assessment along with vocational evaluations um, and boosts client morale and teaches adv advocacy skills. Courtney holds a degree, uh, bachelor's degree in psychology from Tuskegee University 
and a graduate degree from Georgia State University in clinical rehabilitation counseling. Um, and Amber has, sorry, Courtney has uh, many years of experience working with adolescents with various um, disabilities. So um, pleased to have both of you as panelists for our webinar this afternoon. I'm going to turn it over to Amber and Courtney. Hello, thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Amber and I have with me Courtney. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so as Mara covered, the purpose of this webinar is to cover your transition from high school into whatever path you may choose past that. Um, there are various paths that you can take, but we just wanted to give you guys a good jumping board um, to really have a smooth transition. Um, we know that it can be intimidating not knowing where to start. A lot of times when you're younger, I know that was the truth for me. You're not as interested in, you know, the planning portion of what goes into maybe your IEPs, or you kind of let your parents take the lead. Uh, but it's really important that we start to offer this information um, as young as we can so that you have an active role in where your life takes you. So when it comes to transition planning, it generally involves three major activities. So the first one, usually we're working with students and family members to help them think about what goals they have for life after high school. And then we're trying to help you to, to develop a long range plan to get there. This is when you see your guidance counselors coming in, talking to you about, you know, uh, what are your career interests? You know, what um, type of degrees are you interested in getting? Uh, are you interested in a trade? Maybe it could be mechanics or truck driving, whatever, whatever you may be into. Um, once that has happened, we work in designing a high school education that will be tailored to you gaining the skills that you need to achieve those goals. And then lastly, we want to identify any needed services or supports that you might need once you graduate. And we want to be able to link the students and the families with those services before you leave the school system. And this third step is really going to be the majority of our presentation. Um, we will touch on a couple of the other things, but we really wanted to give you a good overview of the different opportunities that are out there so that it's not as overwhelming to you when you get to that point that you're leaving the education system. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Teachers and families support students in identifying post school goals and the steps needed to achieve their goals through ongoing discussion, assessment, instruction, and work-based work activities. This just goes back to what Amber just discussed about the three major activities. So when you're designing a high school education and gaining those skills and competencies to use, whether you're going to college or into the workforce, this is when you have, as Amber um, said, your school counselors, um, they come in and they ask you questions such as, have you signed up for the ACT? Have you signed up for the SAT? Um, have you, um, have you been participating in certain activities to gain volunteer experience and things of that nature to get you out there? Are you making yourself more collegiate, marketable? Um, they go on field trips so you can see a day in the life of maybe someone that works at Georgia Power. Um, you have career day at school where you might go to different booths and have the National Guard out there. You might have different schools out there, different career interests of, to you of, um, out there, excuse me. So just to kind of show, bring the world to you so you can kind of figure out, because you may not know, everything's overwhelming. You may not know what you want to do and that is okay. Um, it's really important to understand that it does take a village, especially in regards to planning your future. 
it's hard to do it alone. So when we say teachers and families support students in identity, identify post school goals, whatever your goal in life is, you have this support system, especially in high school. Because once you leave high school, those supports aren't just offered to you anymore. You have to request them. So when you're meeting with your teachers and you're meeting with your family members as a whole, make sure that you're explaining to them, hey, this is what I see my future looking like. Or maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure. So when they say that this is an ongoing discussion, things can change. Mm -hmm. One day you might have came into ninth grade saying, hey, I want to do this. And then halfway through 10th grade, you took a course somewhere and the whole, it changed everything. And that is okay. This is a journey. Things can change. It can happen. You adapt. Um, when we refer to assessment, um, don't think about it in the form of testing wise. Think of it as a form of a survey. We want to see where can we help you and where are you at. Assess assessments can be geared toward your skill set. What skills do you already innately have that you just do on your own? Maybe it might be writing music. It might be drawing. It might be coloring. You might be a natural team leader. Um, in regards to when you're participating in your different activities with Blaze Sports, you might have gained leadership. You might have came in and was, and was very shy at first. Now you're, um, you don't mind speaking up and being assertive, which is really important in regards to planning your future. So um, just keeping that in mind. And one thing we really want you guys to understand, please understand successful transition planning and implementation, which is the putting in of the planning, the different steps to make the plan happen to reach that goal is student focused. It's you focused. We're worried about you. Trust me, I understand it's hard. A lot of times, based on our different backgrounds and things we went through, sometimes we want to please those around us. This is about you. It's your future. No one can live your life but you. And sometimes I like the way that Courtney pointed that out. You know, it may be a goal that your family had in place that, you know, they wanted you to become a pharmacist or they wanted you to take over the family business, but it really is about what you are passionate about. And even if you don't know, that's okay. It doesn't mean you have to fall in line with what other people are telling you. It just allows you room to get out there and gain experiences while you figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that's all we're doing with this journey of life, just figuring everything out. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about it. Let's just break the ice. I know it's hard, so let's just think of this as a little icebreaker to get the juices of the mind flowing. <laughs> Do you have a plan? It's okay if you don't. We have clients come in all the time that don't know where to start. I've sat down with plenty of students ranging from sec rising second grade and sometimes kindergarten all the way up to college. Sometimes you just really don't know. Sometimes you're really going with the flow. It's okay if you don't have a plan. Let's figure out what do you like? We can start somewhere. Maybe you're one of those individuals who do have a plan. You have your whole life planned out and you already know what you want to do, what you need to accomplish it. Um, you have maybe a little checklist. You have everything outlined. Maybe you somewhat kind of have an idea and it's not really flushed out yet, but you, you just know, hey, I want to start here. I know how to get there. Or maybe you just, you know what your end goal is and you have no idea of how to actually go about that process. It's nothing wrong with that either. It's just determining what place in the planning process are you. Um, think about what are your plans after you finish high school. That's going to determine how your plan looks and what your end goal is. So when we say, are you going to the collegiate route. Do you want to go to college? And it's not always a four-year university. Sometimes it can be a trade school. Sometimes it could be a community college. And even with community colleges, don't think of it as, hey, I'm just going to Atlanta Tech or I'm just going to, for me, when I was back home, I'm going to go to Miami Dade. A lot of these smaller schools feed into bigger universities. Yeah, you might have um, only went to a smaller school. You can eventually 
go back or maybe you just did that because that school offered what you needed at that time. These schools feed into these larger schools, maybe it's UGA, maybe it's Georgia State, and you'll have those first two years of experience under your belt. When you transfer, if you choose to, into these big universities, you already have two years done. You're literally just finishing those last two years and gaining even more experience. And you might bring experiences, real world experiences that you learn at these smaller schools in these smaller classroom sizes and having a different perspective to this larger university. And you're you're part of a very fruitful discussion now. You're changing things. That's the purpose of the work, the, the workforce in general is to bring change and implement change for the better. And I think it's important to to note, like Courtney said, if you aren't sure about your goals, if you don't know what it is that you're passionate about, that's where you look at what can you do over the summer breaks? What can you do throughout the upcoming school years to prepare, whether that is different volunteer experiences um, within different fields? There are apprenticeships. If you are interested in business, you could always you know, try to shadow, um, even if it's in retail, even if you're doing filing for a medical or law office, um, that you want to just take as many opportunities as you can. It's trial and error. You're really just trying to see what fits for you. Exactly. Um, you could be a candy striper at a local hospital. Um, you can ask you might want to work at your local parks and recreation services. You might want to be an assistant coach somewhere, get a little experience, whatever it is that you want to do. You you want to make sure you're doing, you're making those proper stepping stones to lead to reaching your goal. And it doesn't always have to be like we're saying, um, an apprenticeship or anything like that geared toward that. You might just want to be thinking about, hey, I'm going into my junior year of high school. I'm going into my senior year of high school, going back to what do I need to prepare for? Do I need to take the PSAT over? Do I need to retake the SAT? Do I need to, um, does the school I'm looking at require one or the other or both? Mm -hmm. What are my, my targeted scores if I need any at all? Do, do Are they not required? Do I have to take the right question? Like what, what matters in regards to that? And if you are thinking about colleges, make sure whatever colleges you're looking at, it has your major and make sure that um, it's accredited. That's really important because you want your degree to be worth something. Um, you want to make sure that it, it has a really good program. You want to make sure that when you're, when you're, please review, when you're looking, don't be afraid to ask questions. When you're looking into these schools and these programs, you want to make sure that you're able to get these experiences through your, your matriculation through these next two to four years of your life. You don't just want to go into school and not know what you want to do because school is really expensive. You don't want to inquire any kind of debt for something that you won't be able to use or something that hasn't been fruitful because that's going to be really upsetting. Um, also, in regards to colleges, if you're interested in sports, you want to see if colleges have adapted sports. And if they do, what sports do they offer? A couple of these schools include Harvard University. They offer wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis. They have accessible um, strength and cardio machines available. They have hand cycles for recreational use. Um, Michigan State University. They have recreational sports that include adaptive fitness centers, swimming, goalball, wheelchair tennis and basketball as well, floor hockey. Oregon State University. They have a, um, a club wheelchair basketball program. Penn State University, they have um, ability athletics and adaptive um, club activities, which include, once again, wheelchair basketball, run, walk, and roll races, seated volleyball, adaptive soccer, um, Paralympic experience events, and sled hockey. Um, Portland State University, which I found during this research, I never knew, which is really interesting to me. They have an inclusive recreation um, program, and it features an overnight ski trip, wheelchair basketball tournaments, adaptive climbing, adaptive swimming, goal ball, and adaptive gym, UCLA, and things like that. And if this is something that you're interested in, make sure the schools you're applying to not only have your major, but other things that you can use that are of interest to you. 
and just like the regular sports at high schools that have like NCAA and things like that, these are also, they also have national recognition. And if you don't want to go to school route, I know you hear us talking about school, it's okay. It's okay to go to job route, thinking about what, okay, this is my end goal, but this is the kind of job I want. What, what do I need to do to get there post high school? Next slide, please. So just to rewind a little bit, um, we collaborated with Blaze Sports to do a podcast series that was a three-part series to go over helping you navigate um, this planning, like we said, and that will be available through the Youth Lead website with Blaze Sports um, at a later date. I believe Mara will be um, giving you guys that information at the conclusion of the webinar. But I did want to touch just a little bit on what we covered. So we wanted to first assess, you know, your job or career interest, you know, really thinking through how you develop that goal and what um, interest and experiences you may have that can help you hone in on that. We also focused on how to set those goals and get them in motion, how to make a plan, like Courtney was saying, what steps do you need to take? What paperwork do you need? We also will touch on the interview process, whether that be for the school track, whether that be going straight to work, um, just what information that you will need readily available, how to get comfortable with the interviewing process. And then lastly, we covered self-advocacy, how to advocate for yourself in different realms, whether that be at home with your parents, in the workplace, at school. Um, but we really just wanted to give a good, expansive look at what are the little pieces so it doesn't seem so overwhelming to you. Um, and all of that really comes together in this transition plan. Um, so we just wanted to touch on that for a second, let you know that that will be out there again through the Youth Lead website. Um, we won't speak too much on it. Um, but we are really excited to get feedback on that. Uh, next, please. We want you guys to remember, as we said at the beginning of this webinar, that it is your choice. Whatever you decide to do and what route you take post-graduation, it's completely, the ball is in your court. Um, I want to make sure that I say this. Regardless of which way you determine to go on the path and how you start it, it doesn't make you any less of, of an individual, whether you decide to go to college or whether you decide to go to the workforce first. Some people choose to graduate from high school, go into the workforce because they want to gain gainful experience in order to use before they go to college. Doesn't necessarily mean they're, they are not going the college route. Some people just want firsthand experience first. Maybe they never had a job while they were in school because maybe it wasn't allowed. Maybe their parents just wanted them to focus on school. I know that was the case for me. Like I could have got a job, but my mom really wanted me to focus on school. So when I finally did get like volunteer, I got volunteer experience with so no issue, but when I finally actually was able to get like a quote unquote real job experience, it was literally either in something my mom was involved in or somewhere she worked. So no matter which route you take, it's okay. Maybe you want to go to college way first and you might figure out, hey, this might not work for me. So let me jump into the job field and go back. Maybe you, you go to college first, you get your first degree, you get a job. Maybe you go back for another degree or two. Maybe you don't, and I don't want you guys to think you need a four year or two university for things. You can have a job and you can go get a host of different certifications and, and you can make a lot of money and it's not about money, but you can still be successful in whichever route you choose to take, but it's your choice. It has to be your choice and for you. You can't do it for anyone else. Next slide. 
So we wanted to talk a little bit about Georgia vocational rehabilitation. And I'm not sure if you have heard of it or not. It is a government state funded agency that helps individuals with any type of disability in their search for gainful employment. And when I say employment, it could be like Courtney said, where you've, you're coming out of high school and you're ready to go straight to work. It could be that you're, you know, have a career goal in mind, but you need schooling first. So you go to them for help with your schooling process. It may be that you're looking for a stepping stone in between um, and just looking for additional training. But we wanted to go over the process of working with vocational uh, rehabilitation. You'll hear us refer to it as voc rehab, probably the rest of this webinar. Um, Courtney and I actually both have experienced working for the agency. Um, so we're familiar with the process and it can be tedious. We're not gonna lie to you. It is a government agency. There are hoops to jump through. It is a slow process sometimes, but we wanted to give you some tips and tricks to be as prepared as possible to really shave down on the time that is spent and get you where you wanna be a little bit faster. So in high school, the process as counselors, as we would do it, um, counselors will often come out to your school and conduct intakes with the students with parental consent, um, or if they aren't coming to your school for whatever reason, you're able to contact your local office and schedule an appointment for an intake. When we say intake, we are just talking about you go in for an appointment, they're going to ask you if you have a career goal in mind, whether school is a part of that process, they're going to ask you information regarding your disability, they're going to request any documentation that you have available. Really, the goal in that intake appointment is just to gather as much background information as they can to deter help you determine what path is going to be right for you. Once they've done that first initial appointment, they're going to tell you that um, the next step will be determining eligibility. And what we mean by that is they are determining whether or not they can provide services for you because you do have a disability. Now, if you're receiving Social Security, whether that be SSI or SSDI, you are automatically eligible for service services from Voc Rehab. If you are not receiving Social Security, then it's a little bit lengthier of a process, but just bear with us. They're going to request any medical records um, that will show your diagnosis. They may ask for income information uh, to determine whether there will be any cost sharing. For instance, if you were to go the college track, which we'll get to in a moment, um, they would either look, depending on your age, they would look at your income or your caregiver's income. It's really whoever is claiming you on their taxes. They're looking to see what type of income they generate, and then they will use a sliding scale to determine how much they participate in paying for your cost of um, education. Now, time frames. This is where patience comes in. Even if you're automatically eligible with Social Security, the counselors have up to 30 days to change your status to eligible and move you to the next step. If you do not have that SSI or SSDI, they have up to 60 to 90 days to move you through that eligibility phase. So here's where our tips come in. When you go to that intake appointment, if you are able or if your parents or caregivers are able to go ahead and have your medical records printed and in a folder, your social security card, if you have SSDI or SSI, a check stub, your last um, tax report, all of that, if you can bring that with you to the intake appointment, 
that will significantly decrease your waiting time because they won't have to send a release of information form to your doctor's office. Wait for them to get that information. Wait for them to fax it back to them. Um, they're not having to, you know, wait for your parents to dig through, you know, tax receipts and get all of it. If you can have that ready, it will cut down on the time that they need to determine you eligible. If you're in a situation where your diagnosis isn't as clear cut or you may not have seen a physician in a while, they may request additional testing to determine feasibility of goals. And what that means is if you come in saying, I want to be an astronaut, but um, they aren't sure whether or not that might be a great fit for you, whether it be a physical limitation, whether it's a cognitive limitation, they will do further testing, whether that be, you know, sending you to a medical specialist or doing a psychological evaluation, a vocational evaluation. They really are just trying, it's like Courtney said, it's, it's not testing you to pass or fail. It's just gathering information to see what is going to be your best fit. Mm -hmm. um, just to go a little bit more in depth on the process and permission at the beginning, um, just be, be, be yourself and be completely comfortable. Um, I know a lot of times it's hard for us to talk to people about what we go through and things that go on with us. But remember, this is a resource for you. Use this resource. Please use this resource. Um, just to kind of give an example or two examples of how the process can go. Let's say um, I'm a VR counselor and I have a student who is, let's say, 17. And um, we went out to the school. Before we went out there, we sent the forms out to get parental consent so we can talk to the students through the teacher. We go out there, we did the presentation. Hey, this is VR, this is what we offer, what we do, we're here for you. Um, if your parent has signed the waiver that we can talk to you with or without them, you could, you could because you're under the age of 18, um, we'll come out to the school, we'll sit with you and do the intake there if the school allows, or if you come in with your parent, you can come into the office. Um, a lot of times when we come out, we already have gotten your IEPs or 504 plans if you have one from your teacher or from the school. So we kind of have an idea of what services you already have and what plans are already in place to help you succeed, but this is your chance to advocate for yourself and be assertive. It's your opportunity to, to own your life and let us know what you want to do. And I know me, when I used to do my intakes, I always told my, my students and my older clients, this is about you, not about me. Let me know any and everything you feel like you need to get out and give me as much information as possible so I can put it in the system. And when the next phase, because this is just part of the application process, the beginning phase, the whole intake is nothing but the application process. Even though VR is a state funded agency and it's here to help you, you still have to apply at the end of the day. So with that, <clears throat> let's say I have a client, they come in, I have all the documentation. Um, we, we talk through everything. They know a lot, they know where they wanna go. And we get through that. That, that interview can last anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, an hour and a half, just depending on how cognitive you are and how comfortable you are. On the flip side, I have, might have a client that come in and they don't have any information. They don't know anything because their parents have everything and we can't get in contact with the parent because they're at work. That happens and that's okay. We get as much information as possible and we put it in and we go from there. We work with you to get things done. And just a quick little recap of the process. You go through the application. They determine your eligibility. From there, we lead it to a work plan where you give them your goal and we determine what services you need. And then that plan can change, whether it's going to college or it's going to school. Next slide, please. Now, in talking about the collegiate track, if you if your goal end goal on your work plan is to go to college, these are some things that um, 
are going to occur, you're going to have to gather your transcripts, your IEPs, and your five or four plans. Um, you're going to have to identify and apply to your desired schools with your counselor's assistance if you need it. If you don't need assistance and you're like, hey, I can, I can actually do this part of my own, I might contact you if I don't understand something. That's perfectly fine. But you have to have an active role in this process in determining where you want to apply to and where you want to go. Um, whether you're um, getting help from GVRA or doing it on your own, everyone needs to complete FAFSA, the free um, application for federal student aid. Schools require this because you, everyone um, is eligible for federal loans and grants. And to determine that eligibility, you have to complete this application. You have to complete this application. Um, schools require it. Outside of them just giving you their own scholarships and you applying for your own scholarships and grants and things of that nature. Um, submitting documentation for VR, let's say you apply for your passport because VR said it helps. They do have the means to help you go to school and pay for school, but they are going to make sure that you apply for FAFSA first so they know how much is left over to cover and whether that's the covering of tuition, whether that's the covering of books and fees, the cost of living, extra services if you need to, um, assistive technology, which we'll get into later. You have to submit all the documentation and be upfront about it. Um, if, you, if you get accepted into school, make sure you bring them your acceptance letter of the school you choose to go to so they can make sure that they're sending the money and everything to the proper school because they're not going to give you the money directly in your hand and tell you to take it to the school. They're going to have it directly in transition with the school. And you must be enrolled at least half time, which is typically about six credit hours, which is like two classes, um, and maintain at least a 2.0 GPA. And let's just say something comes up where you might have to take a break and pause from school for, for a family or medical emergency, or you might be struggling a little bit. Keep open communication with your counselor. You don't want someone to close your case and you don't want this helpful resource to go away and have to start this process all over again. Because once you're, if your case is unsuccessfully closed, you have to start the process completely over. Now, let's say you did all of this, you did really good in school and the four years are over and you successfully closed your case and something happened, there is a I think it's a hundred days or 190 days where your case hasn't fully been closed out of the system. You can still contact your counselor. Things pop up, things happen. Or if you're in school, like I said, you have to take a pause, let your counselor know. That way your case isn't closed. And let's say, I just want to pause school right now. I'm not ready. I want to go to work. Your work plan, like I said, in, in, um, not too long ago, it can change. And so we can change your plan and focus on a job goal and career goal. But you have to keep that open line of communication open. And don't feel bad. It's all about experience. Next slide. So I spoke a little bit before about stepping stones. If you aren't sure whether or not college is the right path for you, going to the straight to the workforce is the right path for you, um, Voc Rehab has access to two great opportunities. One is Warm Springs, the other is Cave Springs. And when it comes to application and um, requests for services, it's like the college track. The counselors are going to need the same information, your IEPs, um, your income information, social security information, and they will have their own applications to participate in the programs. Um, but they are residential campuses where students are able to learn life skills and work towards professional certifications with either the end goal of employment or learning different skill sets and transitioning from there to going to school. Um, who can attend? That could be individuals, like we said, that may not be interested in going to college for a degree, but they want a certification towards a trade. It might be individuals who have never lived on their own, um, who are looking to learn just 
you know, life skills and to have that college experience um, with a more hands-on approach from the staff to be of assistance. And then the difference is um, Cave Springs is almost identical to Warm Springs, except that it's a little bit more intensive of an experience. So this will be for individuals that need more hands-on assistance. They will have a smaller staff to student ratio. Um, they may take more time when they're teaching the different skills, uh, life skills or trade skills. Um, so it's just a little bit more intimate and a little, when I say intensive, it's just a little more hands-on with the staff. Um, if you're having a harder time with the transition, they may choose Cave Springs versus Warm Springs, where the staff is always available for assistance, but they give you a little bit more free reign of how you navigate your time there. Um, next slide, please. So if you've decided that you know you wanna go directly into the workforce when you leave the school system, then you wanna determine what career field is going to be best for you. And like we said, you learn that through volunteer opportunities, any jobs that you've had over the summer, any extracurricular activities you may have participated in. When it comes to voc rehab, once you've determined your career goal, um, their role is to really help you get there. So that may look like in-house job readiness training, where you go to the vocational office and they're helping you um, create your resume, help you with cover letters, work with you on mock interviews. Mm -hmm. um, if it's available and appropriate, they may send you out on what they call work adjustment trainings. There are two types. Um, a typical work adjustment training is more of a sheltered employment opportunity. It may be something like Bobby Dodd, where you are going into a facility and they are teaching you um, job skills in a more controlled environment. If it's feasible, they may send you on a community work adjustment training. And in that scenario, you might be in a TJ Maxx or a Goodwill um, interacting with the public as you learn these skills. And these are great because if you haven't had a lot of work experience, um, it is something that you will then be able to put on your resume. And it also provides a safe space if you're, you know, having some mistakes along the way or you're having a little difficulty, there are job coaches on these trainings that will assist you as you go through that process. So if you're having a hard time learning the different steps of the job, um, there will be a job coach that is available to help staff with you and the employer, um, or they may even be a support supportive employment coach that is with you every day that you're on these trainings. After you've applied for the desired positions that you're looking for and you've um, landed your interview, because we know you're gonna do great and they've offered you the position, it is then important that you work with your employer and your counselor for any needed accommodations. Again, like Courtney said, this is going to be different than high school where they're offering you these accommodations when you walk in the door. When you get out there in the world, if you're not asking for it, you're not going to get it. Okay, next slide, please. Before I get into assistive technology, I also want to just go back into asking for accommodations. Um, on the collegiate level, the, the most important thing you do if you need accommodations and other resources and you don't know where to go, and ask for disability services or ask for school services to see what do they offer that can help you. <laughs> and maybe you need more time on tests. Maybe you need um, certain modifications or you might be interested in school, but you might want to call or go on a tour and, and see if they um, 
a lot of older schools, let me just put it like this, a lot of older schools aren't up to code and up to date. They don't have the, the sidewalk cut out. It's hard to get around campus. A lot of schools and older buildings do not have elevator access. It may be really hard to maneuver. So you want to keep these things in mind when you're going through the process of applying. You want to go visit these schools. And if you can't, maybe schools now do virtual tours or they'll put you in contact with a student and you can ask these questions. You want to be proactive. But get into, sorry, assistive technology for transition success. Basically, assistive technology is things you might use right now and not even know it's assisting you. Um, but they're devices and services that help people with disabilities um, participate more independently with their home, environment, or school settings. Um, some of these things include, but are not limited to, and they're broken down into three categories. And I put examples up in this little image. So low tech is something that you can use from things and you can create by hand. Things that you can gain and get from around the house, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, Walmart, Office Depot. A grip pencil, for example. I have really bad nerves. So you might see me holding a pen or nothing at all and my hands are shaking. So a pencil grip, for example, is something where, and you might see the many ones you can get and you can slide your pencil through and you can touch it. And it's kind of a sensory thing. It kind of triggers your mind. Or you can, if you have like a tennis ball laying around and you poke a hole through and stick the pencil through, you're gripping it. It kind of controls that 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 nervous tick or that natural um, tick. Um, Post-it notes to help you remember things. We all forget sometimes. Um, raised line paper or um, covered overlays. And when I say covered overlays, think about those colored dividers that we have in our notebook. You can use those if you're having trouble seeing and reading, and sometimes we skip over lines that'll just help you guide you through. Um, some low tech things, a talking calculator, an MP3 player. You might need something to play back for you so you can, or a, um, a recorder so you, you can record the lectures and things and play it back in your dorm room later, or maybe in a library or at home um, so you can take your notes and so that you can um, focus more in the class, like from the lecture, electronic organizers, um, things of that nature. More high tech in, you have e readers like your Kindles, your iPads, your Samsung um, tablets, and things like that, your e readers. Um, basic touchscreen devices. Um, if you need computerized testing, everyone isn't good with paper to pen. Some people are more comfortable taking tests online. And even vice versa, some people aren't comfortable taking tests on a computer. You might need low tech. You might need the paper to pen. Advocate for that. Be assertive in that. Um, text to speech. You might have to take your computer um, in the classroom. Some professors don't allow it, so this is where you have to come in and be proactive and let them know what's going on and discuss that with disability services where I need my computer because it allows me to be more successful in this classroom. I'm trying to maintain a certain GPA. I have a certain goal. And so you use these programs to, as the professor is talking, it's muting everything else out and it's focusing on the words and it's typing it on the screen for you, which is fine. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, progress monitoring software. I think everyone should have this regardless and that is just so you can stay on track. Think of it like as a planner, a schedule. Everyone, some people are, are playing black and white paper to pen. I need my schedule in my phone so I can see it, so I can remain on task. And that's okay. So just to keep that in mind. Next slide. Um, just We're gonna just go ahead and recap. We talked about transition planning how it's okay not to know where to start, what the purpose of it is, the three most important things in transition planning. Amber went over and just to reiterate, you know, is to think about goals that you have for life after high school, whether that's the collegiate track or going into the workforce. Um, we want you guys to remember that you need to design a high school education to ensure that you're gaining skills and competencies to achieve these desired goals. It takes a village, let these things be known. And you want to identify the needed post school services and supports. Um, when you're moving out of high school, like you said, these things are afforded to you in high school because of certain acts and laws that were passed before, before we were even here. 
but in the real adult world, you have to request these things. Hate to say it, but closed mouths don't get fed. You have to, you have to voice your, you have to be, you have to voice your opinion. And it's not being aggressive. It's just standing up for yourself respectfully. You have a responsibility to yourself to advocate for yourself. Your best advocate is you. Um, we went over important questions to ask yourself. Do I have a plan? Where do I start? Do these schools have my major? Do they have the adaptive sporting programs I'm interested in? And just the feedback on that, there are 21 schools that do offer adaptive sporting. Um, what can I do to be more successful and proactive during the summer months? Do I want to do an internship or do I want to volunteer? Do I want to do more research into, hey, what is, what is my future going to look like? Let me make a plan. Um, we talked about it's your choice. That is the whole purpose, is the purpose of us doing the podcast, doing the webinar. You guys being at Blade Sports, getting the support there, being in school with your teachers, team, talking to your guidance counselors, being around your friends. It's your choice. Your future is about you. When you're talking to your friends, like, hey, you know what I thought about yesterday? I'm really interested in this. I think I'd be really good at this. I'm really good at drawing. Despite, you know, my my troubles or whatever, I'm really good at this, and I think I can make a difference. I want to go into cartooning because I don't see, see a lot of me reflected in the cartoons I watch. Something of that nature. It's your choice. We talked about, oh, go ahead. Um, so for GVRA, we really want you to utilize those resources. Uh, a lot of people don't even know about Voc Rehab, but it's important mm -hmm. to know that there is funding out there and there are multiple, multiple ways that they can assist you in getting you where you wanna be, whether that be participating in different work adjustment trainings or getting to experience warm springs, cave springs, or just utilizing the counselor's knowledge and helping you get job ready and setting in place those accommodations in the workplace. And then lastly, we covered assistive technology, which Courtney covered a lot as far as school settings, but this can be on the job as well. Mm -hmm. um, for, is, for instance, a lot of our clients who have seizure disorders, if they're working in an office setting, you know, it could be as simple as cutting up a swimming pool tube to put around the edges of a desk to protect them should they have a seizure at work. Mm -hmm. It could be that you need extra time when you're testing on campus. Um, it could be, you know, different type to text or more elaborate assistive technologies, but these are things that Voc Rehab can provide for you. So it's important that you utilize those services and ask for the assistance. Okay. Next slide. Um, we provided um, a really concise list of resources here for you guys. Um, if you click, and once you click on the link to um, pacer.org, they have a lot of information on transition planning. When I say a lot, just this one link, it goes through everything and more that we talked about today. They have a lot of different activities for you and your parents. If you don't know where to start, um, how to start and things of that nature. We included the link for Voc Rehab. And I also included the Social Security Work Incentives Glossary because if you, when we mentioned SSI and SSDI, there are things to think about in regards to that. And a lot of this verbiage old terms, you may not know you want to be aware of. Yes, and I do believe as well, um, I can see that there is a handout available that I believe Mara will be um, making available to you guys afterwards as well, that we'll have a more extensive resource list. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide. So question and answer portion. Do you guys have any questions for us? Anything you want us to elaborate on, go a little bit more in detail on? Maybe we glossed over it. Um, Courtney and Amber, thank you so much. This is Mara. Um, we have um, one uh, one question that um, I'm not sure. I'll just kind of throw it out there, then either of you can take it. But um, at what age? Uh, and this is a parent asking. 
Um, at what age should um, a youth start this whole transition planning process? Is there any set age or? I would say as early between the ages of 14 to 16. Yes. Okay. I believe that the, the youngest that Voc Rehab will work with them 14. is 14. Yes, that, that is correct. Okay. So, um, so 14 is not too soon to start. No, I think okay. it's important. And they actually just implemented that a few years ago. It was older, mm -hmm. but they realize it's important to get them as soon as they're trying to make it so that they're catching them in um, phasing out of middle school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so as early yeah. as you can. Great. And um, Courtney, I think I'm going to uh, quote you. Um, Your best advocate is you um, by Courtney Dean. Um, I think that's a wonderful um, quote, I think, for all of our young people to uh, remember. And um, that, you know, if we don't speak up, you're going to pass you by. So thank you for saying that. That was very inspirational. No problem at all. Um, I think that was uh, that was in terms of of questions. Um, so I I do want to say thank you to um, Courtney and Amber for all the fabulous information. Really kind of breaking down this um, sometimes challenging um, and confusing transition process and it was you made it sound really simple and really broke it down so I really think that's going to be beneficial to um, all our young people whatever path they they choose um, quite honestly and even though play sports so one of our big obviously sports is in our name and so we do sports and physical activity because we believe in the power of sport but we don't do sport just for sport. It is, uh, we use it more as a vehicle and as a way to bring awareness to um, young people with disabilities that um, you know, one, you know, being physically active and being healthy is an important part of being successful in school and doing well. And then whatever your future career and path leads you to, uh, whether that's right into employment or um, another going to college and, and pursuing a career. Um, that's really why we do the Youth Lead Initiative um, is because it all kind of connects with each other. And I'll do another plug for um, the podcast series that um, Amber and um, Courtney uh, with Epilepsy Foundation of Georgia led for us. Um, the first is, a, a th it's a three-part series about finding your career path and it's it's super. Um, and you can really listen to it at your leisure and start and stop it and rewind it. Um, and and then the last one was about self-advocacy. And again, I remember what Courtney said was your best advocate is you. Um, and so they both kind of break down what, what it is and why is it important? How do you use it um, as a young person? Um, so we're going to be um, making those available on our website um, before the end of the week. And we'll be sending an email to all of our constituents when it's available and then sharing on our social media sites. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us for this um, really information rich webinar. Amber and Courtney, thank you. Um, I am grateful for your partnership. And um, again, the webinar has been recorded and will be shared with you um, by email in a couple of days. Thank you so much for having me.